pretty cool to be here again. It was in 2013 that we as a team had stood up here and decided what if we went to the other end? And Lord almighty, we didn't realize what we were getting into when we decided that, but it was the best adventure ever. From this point up here, it took almost seven years to be able to shoot three more series, finish the one we were on, and then shoot two more on our way down to Ushuaia at the very bottom of Argentina. So it's pretty special to be back on the other side with that completed at this point in my life. You wonder what's going to be in the next 10 years. So I'm going to go that way and find out. Expedition Overland Season 5, the Nordic Series, is presented by General Tire. For whatever you do, General Tire delivers. And in association with Patriot Campers, the ultimate in overland trailers. And by X Overland's official apparel partner, Vertex. The Nordic series. How exciting is this place? This place is incredible. The mountains are insane. Like compared to Alaska, it's just unbelievably beautiful. And I feel like every day I've been saying that, like this is the most beautiful, this is the most beautiful. From the moment we met up with the crew, there hasn't been a dull moment. You know, normally there's like a warm up phase of like, you know, everyone getting to know each other and then then it starts getting fun in the crew and then that makes everything feel more fun. Like even if you're in a great place, if there's not a good dynamic between people, it can kind of take away from the experience. As a team, we have decided we want to reach the most northern end of the road in Nordcap. Our lead navigator and my dear friend Kurt is the only one on the team who seems to be aware of the long distances we need to travel to reach our goal of arriving at Nordcap. We're packing up at this beautiful camp. We had an amazing time up at Trollsigen, which is like the Trolls Path, this awesome switchback road. Eventually, we gotta start going north, though. We keep promising ourselves we'll make it up there, but Norway's just so amazing, we, uh, we can't get any progress because we just keep checking out more cool things. It's been a hard part of my day-to-day -day is just choosing, not just talking about where we go and how we get there and when we're gonna be there, but really, starting to limit some of the places we're going to be able to go, which is tough to do because it's all so scenic and it captures so well, it's so fun and we're enjoying it and the camping's been fantastic. But at the end of the day, we gotta get to Nordcap and we still have a lot to explore in Finland and Sweden before making our way back to Denmark where the vehicles will get put on the ferry uh, headed further west. Roll up your rain jacket. Hold your rain jacket upside down. <laughs> Zipper out. Hold it in. In thirds. More or less, in thirds. Okay. Then the sleeves go up. Roll down. Nice and tight. Tuck it in. What? To the hood. Boom. Mind blown. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> While Kurt is calculating the cold hard equations of miles and time, I naively am still fooling around with rain jackets. Whoever can do it the fastest wins. Help. <laughs> you get, you get a C for effort. A C for effort. <laughs> oh yeah. We're almost full. You're about three ticks. It does feel like an intestine. You felt an intestine before? I have. Oh. <laughs> felt a, that's weird, but I felt a lot of intestines. I've seen Shelly's intestines before. Yeah, that one that. time when we had a baby. Mm -hmm. I looked over the curtain and they had their, they were like, it's and like, I was like, ah! It 
probably sat like, back down. Then a baby came like out. This. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh god! Of the trailer. Okay. There's a lot of water to cross in Scandinavia. And ferries are a fixture within Norway's highway system. And it's a fun part of how one gets to travel around here. We're getting used to traveling by ferry on our push north, but there is a road to the west that demands a detour. Europe's roadways have their own personality of going through it rather than around it and it's a trade that leads to engineering wonders and architectural feats. We've set our sights on the Atlantic Road, and the important fact here is that it was featured in one of my all-time favorite James Bond films, No Time to Die. I can feel Kurt's rising anxiety about getting us to NorCap, but the Atlantic Road has to be driven. No, oh, look at that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I think Kurt secretly wants to drive it too. Up until 1989, these islands were only accessible by boat. The Atlantic Road is a once-in-a-lifetime experience that can't be missed. And I don't regret the detour, at least not yet. We find ourselves waking up the next morning in a gravel pit. Right, it's connected, so pull the pad. How's your chin doing, Dan? Well, Clay did a good job. It's uh, pretty much fully healed up, and it doesn't hurt anymore. So. That's nice. We actually stay in gravel pits quite a lot throughout our travels. We've stayed them. I mean, in every country I can think of, I've probably stayed in a gravel pit, but it's nice because of the sandy ground and it's really nasty rainy out. You can find a spot here that's not so muddy versus grass or, or mud. This, the gravel of a gravel pit makes it perfect for a rain camp. So we nailed it last night. They're not all glamorous, but it's very utilitarian. We got a great night's sleep and now we can motor on to Sweden. Our pursuit of Nordcap in avoidance of the storm will take us east into Sweden and unknowingly steers us into some of the team's personal curiosities. Besides the epic scenery and the trails and the hikes and the lakes and rivers and beauty of it all, I've also had a deep fascination with the history. Oh, wow. That looks incredible. Nestled in the Norwegian city of Trondheim, the Nidaros Cathedral is an architectural masterpiece and the northernmost medieval cathedral in the world. Built over a thousand years ago, it's obvious why Caroline is eager to spend time within its walls. Man, this is insane. We're uh, here at the Nidaros Cathedral, which was first constructed in 1070 and finished getting built in the 1300s. But this is uh, built over the site of King Olaf II's burial site, which is pretty incredible. Uh, King Olaf II became a saint for spreading Christianity here in Norway. And uh, actually a really cool thing is that Leif Erikson himself came from Greenland or Iceland and became a Christian here. 
It really is amazing. It's quite a place to visit. Like this face of the cathedral here is breathtaking. I've never seen anything like it. So we're gonna be going inside and we're really gonna see some amazing stuff. These places help put time into perspective. And the Nidaros Cathedral we are walking through right now took 230 years to build, almost as long as the U.S. has been in existence. It's, it's hard for my brain to fathom how they got put together. It agreed, yeah. Like, my head doesn't yeah. sort it out. Yeah. If you haven't noticed by now, the Van Stralens are a well-educated family, and we're lucky to have this well-read trio of siblings along for our journey through Northern Europe. Their insight has offered a lot of value to our time here. There's a key in there. Where's it go? That one too? Is there, is there bodies in there? Dude, I think there's bodies in there. After spending three hours here in the cathedral that's gone by in the blink of an eye, I am starting to feel Kurt's anxiety about getting to Nordcap. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. But we must keep going. Yeah. She belongs in a museum. Oh yeah, so do you. <laughs> The Nidaros Cathedral has been a welcome break from the delirium that threatens you when you're trying to make lots of miles in a short amount of time. We're not sure though how much longer we'll be able to keep that delirium at bay. Yeah, so officially welcome to Sweden. Rolling through customs and we're not getting flagged at all. I think no problem. No problem. We made it. We're going to head to the TT, the Trans Euro Trail, and pick back up uh, here in Sweden and use that as a great way to head north and uh, just see kind of what progress is like and what the trail's like, what the route's like what camping's like up that way. So we're gonna go through, I think it's Oster, Ostersund, Ostersund. And that's probably where we'll do a full fuel up and then head a little further east before catching the trail and hopping off on dirt gravel and head north. Copy, copy. This is really trippy because in the United States, green is diesel. So it feels like we're just putting the wrong fuel in the car. Which we did do once in, uh, I think it was Bolivia, and we got really good gas mileage for like a while. The truck didn't run great, but it got really good mileage. Don't recommend it. That's the thing that I once is on the internet. Yeah, don't do that. But it's what happened, it happened on accident. The Van Stralen brothers love to goof around and have debates, especially at gas stations and I love to secretly leave on the in-car cameras There's to catch no them idea. in the act. The the Last summer in Alaska, it was a snickerdoodle causing the mischief, and this year, it's one of their famous debates on who has something longer, faster, stronger, you name it. This time, it's about who has larger hands. We've done this before. <laughs> yeah. Mine are bigger. They're not bigger. Okay. So did you guys settle that? Who has the bigger hands? I mean, it depends on the angle you look at. Dan thinks he has bigger hands, but I think mine's bigger. <laughs> Just the thing is, is uh, Dan's hands made it like baby skin. Baby skin? I, and your hands are disgusting. His, his hands are made of baby skin. <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> well, then who has the bigger arms? Arm span? Dan. Man. They're arguing right now. I for guarantee for sure. <laughs> DJ to be determined. I, I have to check it out tonight. Well. Would you rather have the bigger hands or the larger arm span? Right. 
that's tough. Uh, I think arm span would uh, be better. Quick. Also, I, I can do more push-ups than him. That one has been proven. My hands are stronger. <laughs> My finger strength and grip your strength is strong. Would you uh, shut off your GoPro? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> There's something about getting your own trucks and the way that you've designed the vehicles to live out of, and then you put yourself in this little ecosystem that you've created on four wheels, and you start taking this little ecosystem into the unknown. And you get, you look out the windows and you step out and you get to smell and see these places, but yet you're anchored, you're anchored in your own little piece that's yours. And it, it creates a very amazing experience. We're using these mobile ecosystems to push hard to NordCap. We have several hundred miles to go yet, and we'll be tapping into every single resource they have to get us there. Pushing North has found us back on the Trans-Euro Trail, this time in Sweden. It's a kind of backcountry discovery route through Europe. It feels good to be off pavement, even if it's just for 100 miles. Driving through the dense boreal forest of Sweden makes it hard to fathom that we'll eventually pass through it into a treeless arctic landscape near the top. Tonight we're taking advantage of the cover and coziness the forest has to offer. I won't put my thumb in there this time. Getting into camp somewhat earlier than normal is allowing Kurt and I to tackle some maintenance on the rigs. Okay. Try the other side. Tonight's chore is the hubs on the trailer. That side's tight. Uh, I think it's just got more tension on it. Do the old uh, high school shake of the whole trailer first before we take the lug nuts off, see how it feels. I mean, trailers do this all the time. You gotta watch their hubs. And we've put, I don't know, this has probably got another 5,000 miles on it since we tightened it in Alaska. And it just, they loosen up, they walk, they pack out a little bit. And as they do that, and the grease leaves and everything, you just kind of keep tightening them up. If you don't, it allows too much play in the bearing. Okay. And they, they'll essentially just degrade and break down. Yeah, that feels a lot better. Cool. Okay, I got her. Okay. Come in. What does he say when he drops the lug nuts in the snow? Oh, fudge. Yeah. I said the mother of all oh. words. <laughs> Where did you learn that? <laughs> I knew I couldn't say my father, <laughs> though I'd heard him say it a hundred times. You know, ultimately it doesn't really matter to me where I am in the world or what I'm doing, how good the weather is or how bad or how broken something is or how good it's running. All that really matters to me is that I'm there with my friends. Yeah. We're talking about trying to see if we can get all the way up to here. And then if we have enough time, we're going to go over to here, right on the Russian border. There's a campsite right there. Well, let's finish out this section down to down to town where our fuel is. Okay. Which is a kind of like as much as we did today, we'd do that section again. So we'd be done by like lunchtime tomorrow. Yeah. Roughly, and that's our good fuel spot. And that's a good stop off point to maybe get some miles and get up to one of these north, you know, further north sections, kind of do another north section. Yeah, and like, I like burning into these places, like doing a small section to go camp. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. You know? Because um, either way, we still have a, you know, three, four day drive just to get up to NordCap. Cause I'd rather buy some time up here. Agreed. Yeah. Then and spend be able it to, down here. Be able to come out to this camp yeah. option. That's northeast point, like as far east 
as you can get in Norway. That's oh, the that, eastern. That gets me excited. Yeah, and it's not far off of the whole easternmost of the Nordic countries too. So on, on in other news, I think our decision to bail, to bail from going into Norway or going up the top with oh, all those man. women. Look at that. That's like Either hunkering way. right down where we would have been. <laughs> yeah, we, we would have been we were cut right through the middle of this. We still could get hit by it on the back end, but that's where the big mountain pass, the mountains are right there. So I'll bet it dies off by the back end of it. It's our first full day in Sweden today. I'm gonna try to make some kilometers because um, Kurt keeps on reminding us that we are behind schedule to get to Nordcap in time. So we are, yeah, we're packing up early. I'm gonna hit the road. And unfortunately, the weather already looks like it's closing in on us. So time will tell whether we'll have nice clear skies or if we're gonna be stuck right in the middle of the storm we're trying to avoid. So exo travel is significantly different than the way that I normally travel. Usually it's my wife and I in one vehicle and it's very, very slow, slow travel. We, we meander through countries or a continent and over a period of two or three days, we might travel a couple hundred kilometers. But here we're doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers a day because we have a very short period of time to do a lot of work, to film a lot, to experience a lot. And we're trying to jam it all into these long days. And to be honest, I like it a lot. The idea that we kind of came up with is that we will keep pushing pretty hard. We'll do the little dirt road this morning and then we'll be coming back through these types of places on the way home anyway. So we're going to burn really hard, as hard as we can to get up to the top, drive hard today, swap drivers. If you're feeling tired, uh, there was a point yesterday where I probably should have swapped a driver and prepare for bad weather. Everything that we were seeing on the radars and everything of the next possibly week will be 80% chance of rain every single day. A big difference we are finding between overlanding in Europe and our prior experiences in the Americas is the sheer amount of pavement here. As we pull into gravel pit number two, no one is paying attention to the lack of charm in our chosen campsite. We are simply grateful to stretch our legs. Well, we will be in Sweden less than 48 hours. We knocked it out. We crossed all of Sweden today. That's awesome. We're, one, we're literally one hour from the border. Crazy. This is how I get out of doing things. I just, I'm like, I'm <laughs> filming right now. <laughs> I've often accused the camera crew of this, Richard. <laughs> but you work your tail off, so I'm not gonna accuse you no. of that. Just because we're camped in a gravel pit doesn't mean there is a lack of opportunities for the extraordinary around us. Look at that thing. Look at that, a reindeer antler from Sweden. It's got an actual paddle on it. We're just walking around talking about how much fun it'd be to look for antlers. Right by our feet, reindeer antler. Look at that. Now let's go show the rest of the crew. See what Dan found? Found a reindeer antler. Sweet stick, man. <laughs> no. That is so <laughs> cool. That's a good one. Your mom would die. Sweet on right the <laughs> Uh huh. The less desirable aspects of the trip, like long road days, are 
also the parts that make the simple things sweeter, like wrestling around with your brother. I'm getting stolen! <laughs> Richard's birthday today and we didn't know about it because I'm really bad at remembering birthdays just found out we just left town so we're doing a little of Richard's favorite chocolates a smattering of chocolates and I'm making a low cup of coffee for him and I had Cyrus go collect twigs for candles so we'll see how this goes <laughs> we put like a little uh, hand sanitizer in there oh yeah dude that'll light up like crazy I think we only get one shot at this It's like <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> That's my level. There we go. Okay. Oh no. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Richard. Hold one second. Hold, pause. Come on, get over here, Richard. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Blow it out before it does. You gotta get her. Yeah! Is that the free hand sanitizer? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, cup of coffee. Thank and you. And an assortment of European chocolates. Mm. <laughs> I haven't seen any of these yet. And also it looks like an after eight. It is an after oh. eight. From my homeland, more yes, or less. From your homeland. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. It's a good space Have to have it. Mmm. <laughs> Everybody, please help yourself to some birthday chocolate. <laughs> Caroline mm. made the pretty assortment yeah. for you. For my I appreciate I mean, it. <laughs> I can't believe I'm 29. <laughs> Sounds about right. More, more or less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More or less. Plus or minus 10 Give years. Or take. <laughs> it feels so good to be traveling again internationally. And I know I've, I've said that a lot, but I don't realize how much I miss it until I'm here and you're interacting with different cultures and I'm trying to figure out what food to buy in the grocery store and I can't read the language and I just... All of that is so great for me because you're constantly problem solving. You get to make fun of yourself with the locals because you don't know how to say the language like Sibisugu Dijivor. And you just go for it. And the people here are incredible. As domestic overlanders, we're often seeking out remote places far away from people where we can find solitude. But international overlanding refocuses our attention back to the people in the areas that we get to explore. So they have salmon soup? Uh, no, I didn't see that. Yeah, there's a sign back there that said salmon soup. Oh, this place is cool. Oh, wow. It's like a yurt. <laughs> Hello. A wooden Hi. yurt. I like it. Hello. 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 This is a local's smokehouse, which is only open in the summer because the rest of the year, they're out catching the fish that they're selling today. What is your favorite? What's the best? Uh, uh, this is uh, local. It's uh -huh. the salted reindeer. Oh, reindeer. salted reindeer. Or, uh, smoked fish meal. Smoked fish meal? Yes. Okay. Mm, I will try the salmon with the blue cheese. Blue cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to try it. I'm going to do it. Thank you. I'll, I'll get the char fish, fish meal. Arctic Please. char, okay. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Work for me and my day. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You can ask more bread if you want. Thank you very much. Fish is really good. Tasty? Yeah, very tasty. Kurt and I wanted to experience both the salted reindeer and the smoked salmon. So we got two orders, split them perfectly in half. Pete, unknowingly, we just checked off my bucket list item we were talking about this morning. What? Without even realizing it. I just had an old Finnish lady <laughs> make me food. I gotta get a bite of your reindeer. Yeah, that makes me wonder your what else list. is on your bucket list. <laughs> it's a unique one. You gotta hear some of them. I wanted to have an old lady in Finland serve me food. Isn't it nice though? This it is, is, nice. this is why it was on the bucket list. I kinda like the way you think. 
The way you said it, it's like, it's like you want her to feed you the food. <laughs> That's, that, that hasn't been checked off yet. Open I'll wide, Dan. I'll have to come back. The airplane's coming cool. in. The people you meet along your journey are important. Their way of life, their differing perspectives, and their stories will enrich your experience and perhaps even change you if you keep an open mind. There is a kind of healthy balance here as an overlander between solitude and socializing that makes for the most impacting trip. And you often don't realize it until you get home. What I'm really looking forward to is uh, there's like some pictographs and carvings in stone that were done at like, I can't remember, it was like 400 BC and possibly to 4200 BC, which is insane. That's just, that's so long ago, like 4,200 years before like BC is like before most recorded history, which is amazing to see. The UNESCO World Heritage Site houses most of the artifacts for us to look at. The Alta Fjord, far north of the Arctic Circle, bears the traces of a settlement in the form of elaborate rock art dating from around 4200 to 500 BC. 2,000 and 7,000 years ago. That's incredible. So that is real. It says in 2019, the rock turned up in the basement of a school. It per fit perfectly with one of the panels at Hemjeloft. Perhaps there are more pieces in the World Heritage lying around in attics and basements. So somebody, the bear is part of the panel, six to 7,000 years old. That one down there? Yeah. Wow. So I guess this is what it would have looked like 20,000 years ago. We were just listening to the book with Kurt in the car and it said that most of this area was uninhabited. Once all the ice caps or the ice started melting, then people were able to uh, immigrate into these areas. What was left was really, really lush farmland. Pretty sure due to the fact that I still look like a caveman, my ancestors came from here because well, I'm from Sweden. Uh-huh. So it's very possible that some of my ancestors chipped some of this rock. I mean, we are artsy people. That's you are artsy people for sure. The thousands of paintings and engravings here tell a lot about the environment and human activities that went on throughout this region thousands of years ago. I think one of the joys of overlanding is the ability to gradually see the global picture of history and humanity, culture and civilization and then begin to feel your place within it. He's fighting over a log with it. Oh, look at the dudes up on the boat with a spear. Whoa. That is rad. Oh, that's so cool. And then there's, there's Peter and Dan. Yep, that's Peter and Dan for Peter sure. Peter and Dan. Who <laughs> found you? Right there. <laughs> <laughs> so am I the guy that's uh, flipping out, or is that? Well, you guys can you guys can have a debate about that. Yeah, you'll have to have a debate, but I think Dan's getting chased and Peter's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fascinating. All the way up here, these artifacts here on the fringes of the far north have left us with a bigger picture of the human race and its transition into who we are and what we are today. So I love going to the grocery store, trying new things, figuring out what meals to put together. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge because I you don't just have the staples like, oh, we'll just have this and that and spaghetti and tacos and whatever. You can find that stuff, but I'm, I'm also wanting to be more like, what, what do people love doing here? What do they love cooking? What's good? And so trying to really just go all into the culture of every country we travel in is really fun. Yeah, I might have you come in and try to level up in this one. What do I need right now? Ooh, what do you got there? Oh, Richard. Hot dog. Bun. Tulsa. Tulsa. Bun. Actually, the brioche bun. Toasted. Fancy. Mustard. Lots of it on this end. Like, an extreme <laughs> amount because I couldn't control it, the... It didn't have a nice, the utter, like... Uh, it's not fancy mustard, so... No. no. 
and then uh, and then ketchup. Sweet. I got a bite before I got on camera because it's awkward to eat a hot dog on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to my work. Yeah. Goodbye. The hot dog. What's it called? A pulsa is like the sandwich of Norway. It's in all the kind of like U.S. It's in all the gas stations and stuff. But it's it's apparent that it's kind of like the one of the national things to eat. It's feeling soft. Ooh, yum. That looks good. This is brie cheese. This is wedged on the tembo tusk. If you just slowly heat it with some tin foil, covering the bottom of it, it'll melt. And then when you cut off the top, you can get like, we toasted up some bread just to use up some bread we had. And you can just dip it right in the cheese and eat it almost like a fondue, you know, dipping bread into liquid cheese. Almost warm enough. Bread for mm -hmm. Good. Super good. If I made it, it would have been better. Finally being able to come here because family members that lived in Norway and our families came here quite a bit, but this is my first time. So I've you know, kind of grown up with stories about this place and uh, finally am here to experience it for myself. So it's just really, really cool. Our camp here in Alta is providing a much needed restoration from our long push north. Nordcap feels close. I find it pretty remarkable how fast that terrain tr turned from like looking like the Pacific Northwest to this. This is looking much more arctic to me. Definitely it's starting to look a lot more like uh, marshy tundra. I think it's fun seeing as many reindeer as we are too. Yeah, I mean, we were just looking at a whole bunch of reindeer on those rock uh, carvings and paintings there in Alta. And then it's nice to see them actually out in the tundra. This is really what uh, I was picturing when we were talking about going up north to Norway. As overlanders, when heading towards your next dot on the map, you're bound to run into others who share the same goal. <laughs> Sometimes that experience can be humbling, as in this man's case. Hans is walking his way from Ushuaia to Nordcap. You need agua con comida, chocolate, chocolate, yeah. Kurt and I are happy to offer him some words of encouragement and a cold drink to give him a little boost along the way. Suerte. Gracias. Suerte, suerte. Gracias. But in reality, I think he gave us the refreshment and the boost. Thank you. Yep. It never fails. As soon as you think you're doing something cool, yeah. there's always someone out there else out there doing something way cooler. Walking around the world. Did I hear him say it's gonna take him two years? Uh, a couple years, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. So cool. Yeah. Woo. All right, well, we'll continue on to Nordcap ourselves. There we go. Getting back in our vehicles, everything feels a little easier than it did just a few minutes ago. We are arriving at Hammerfest, the northernmost town in the world opposite of Ushuaia, Argentina, the most southern city in the world. And Hammerfest is the home to the originating landmark of the Struve Geodetic Arc. The Geodetic Arc is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that spans over 1,700 miles and 10 countries. And it's the only UNESCO site in the world like it. The Arc is the life's work of German-born Russian astronomer Friedrich George Wilhelm von Struve, 
His mission was to survey the first ever meridian line on the map and prove that the world was not perfectly round, but instead elongated around the equator due to the spinning of the Earth. I don't know that this one was properly part because there were, right. were mountaintops. This may be a memorial to the survey markers. Right. They were all cairns up on t and survey markers on top of the peaks, and they used that to survey one to another all the way down to the Black Sea. So they're all line of sight. And then they, they take their measurements Measurement. and they could calculate the curvature, curvature of the Curvature and flattening of the Earth, because I think it was Newton decided that it wasn't purely a round sphere, there was some flattening because of the poles. And they were determined, they got very close in the 1850s to what we know to this day from the previous estimate. Wow. Of how curvature, like the radius and diameter. It always pretty blows, amazing stuff. Yeah, blows me away what they could do with analog stuff. Very analog. You know, and how accurate think people can get with that in the old school tech to compare to like all of our fancy stuff right now. Yeah. It took him 39 years to complete the project. Two centuries later, we are navigating our way to Nordcap using technology descended from Struve's scientific efforts, which, by the way, were within 150 yards of accuracy. We can still go further north from here. This is the most northern city, but we can go to the most northern point. There's a little bit more road left. Yeah. Tomorrow's goal is 71 degrees, 10 minutes, and 21 seconds north by 25 degrees, 47 minutes, 4 seconds east, also known as Nordcap. Our camp is within sight of our goal, but it looks like the fierce Atlantic storm we've tried so hard to miss is about to hit us head on. It was a rough night of sleep as the storm moved in. 50 mile an hour gusts eventually ripped our rain fly from its zipper on the X3 trailer. Don't let that fly away, Dan. Don't let it set sail. How about there? Yeah, we probably tucked some stuff in there. Let me get one It will need to be reattached in better conditions at our next camp. Plus, we have bigger things to get to this morning. This is a pretty big accomplishment for the team to get to hit another one of those landmarks off of our list. And now, we are arriving at Nordcap, the farthest point north you can drive in the Northern Hemisphere. Reaching this place on the Earth is 12 years in the making. and 846 miles from when we touched down in Belgium, and almost exactly one year from our polar swim in the icy waters of Prudhoe Bay, the opposite side of the Arctic Ocean, none of us would have predicted that one year from then, we would be here at Nordcap. Close to just losing his hat. Just gonna hang on to this. I would have been a goner. There's a decent cliff there. 
took this hat to Prudhoe Bay almost a year ago to the day. So made it to the Arctic Ocean there, took it to the Arctic Ocean here. Almost left it in the Arctic Ocean here. <laughs> Since we all made it, you get your official Nordic patch. <laughs> 71 degrees north latitude. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Put it in Richard's you. pocket. Put it in your pocket, Richard. Here's my pants pocket. <laughs> they had cool coins, too. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. This will be the uh, team challenge coin. Official team cha challenge coin, I guess, of our of our trip. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Well, it's only south from here. Sounds good. Once again, we find ourselves at the end of the earth, standing in a place where kings have stood, looking out upon this very site. Vision, work and sacrifice have led us here. Since XO began 12 years ago, we have never stopped pushing ourselves to reach further and to explore the places that lay outside of our comfort zone. Our travels now have taken us to the far northern shores of Alaska, to the westernmost edge of South America, and to Land's End in Ushuaia. And now, on a new continent, Nordcap. And we're not done yet. Coming up on the Nordic series are some incredible discoveries beyond our wildest dreams, and some hard lessons learned that will most certainly shape our perspectives forever. It's as good as it gets, but the aftertaste is bittersweet. Join us next time on episode four of the Nordic series. <laughs>